bothered doing it. The ENC sub K, that yeah. there's like a family of encryptor functions. ENC sub K, honestly, is just my convenience way of saying I initialize encryption with, with key K. There's oh, another. Key K. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's why I said ENC sub K. You know what? Honestly, a lot of most texts. Um, this is just simple for me because I have to draw less arrows, honestly. But if you want to be more formal, right. it's like that. You yeah. put a key into the encryption function, and then you have to put that key into every single one. But as you can see, I'm a lazy writer. So if I write sub k, it's a lot less writing than writing an arrow and key 30 times. And uh, is, is, does anybody not have the repository? I'm imagining a lot of you don't because a lot of you came late. So clone that. Um, and then, so. I'm going to walk through the code because I'm sure some of you are not pro scholar programmers. Um, and just a heads up, I'm sorry, John, but if you remember, TSEC is under cats, so it's not scholar today. I'm sorry. I forgive you. It's okay. I'm sorry. Again. Okay. So, anyway, um, we're going to go on and tell you now. And I'm going to give you, some, you guys some time to start. So, we're going to. So, by the way, the setup of this thing is going to be super simple. I did not make it super complicated because I know some people probably don't know SPT work very well. So, the way that you're going to run these things, are you, you're just going to call like something slash run, and it's going to print something to the console. That's it. That's all. That's all we need to do. Um, it's going to be super simple way of dealing with this stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, wow, holy moly, it's already been an hour. I'm not even sure if we're going to be able to cover everything. Hope so. But all right, um, so oh, this is not the one we're, we're looking at, by the way. This is a later one. I'm going to remove the spoilers. And for the, so now that I have a second, um, I can talk about what, what people fork the repo. I can talk about um, now how this ties into a functional programming construct. Um, and I'm going to use TSX cipher class. And oh, wait, no, not this one. Sorry. Uh, I think it's symmetric cipher. This is a different one. Uh, God. Uh, yeah, I'll be able. I'll, I'll I'll zoom in in a second. I'll be. Uh, it's just you know you know what happens when the when the library author forgets his own library. That's exactly what's happening right now. So I'm. Uh, I'm. Uh, there you go. I called it encryptor. Um, so I'm imagining that you most of you are somewhat, so this is not exactly a super beginner one, so I'm imagining that some of you are somewhat familiar with functional programming, either in Haskell or in Scala. Um, so this is essentially our algebra, because in Scala, this is how we encode finally tagless. Um, this is our algebra for being generic over encryptors in Scala. So this is how TSEC encoded it, is that we're going to, so the thing is that we need some effect type. We need some effect type because if you talk, if, you guys were clearly paying attention to me, then you know that pseudorandomness implies, you know, um, and generating IV analysis implies, in the real world, it implies state. So we cannot have state purely functionally without having an effect, having it tied to uh, IO, for example. So this effect is going to abstract over that. Um, um, yes? Question. I'm not finding that particular file. Oh, no, 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 no. This, so so this, this is not in the repo. If you use IntelliJ and you use Control N to navigate, this is part of TSEC specifically. This is not part of the repo because this is part of the library I wrote. And I think uh, for the few people that, I missed, that missed it, um, part of the reason why I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to promote my own library, it just cuts my work in half because I already wrote it. So that's exactly why, why I'm using TSEC. But it's not, not for any promotional reasons. Um, anyway, so if you think about it, it's, it's a really simple concept. Um, when we talked about essentially how an encryption, it just has an, like, you know, we have ENC. If we, if we run this function like this for some message M, K, or you know what, let, let's, let's be consistent. I'm going to use a sub K notation. And sub K, sub K, D, C, C sub K, we're going to get M. Um, but remember that in the real world, we need, we need, initialization vectors and we need randomness. So simply, our encryption function simply takes a plain text and it takes some k, k which is a higher kind of type. It's simply a star to star type. So if you, if you guys are familiar with Haskell notation, it's simply a type that, it's a type constructor that takes one type. So it's inhabited by one type only. And 
So our key is parameterized over A, and A is our algorithm. Because, and the reason why this is extremely useful is because AES keys of a particular length only work for that length. I cannot use AES128 keys for AES192, so on and so forth. I cannot use keys for a different cipher. Technically, for now, if we want to be super, super exact about it, you can use keys that are the same length on different ciphers. So really what matters is the key length. However, this helps us at the type level um, to know whether you generate the right key or not. So it's some nice, yes? Mm, not necessarily, no. Not necessarily. No. And for stream type, no, not necessarily either. Um, and in general, actually, for example, AES, um, which is the one probably everyone knows, um, has only 128, what's it called? It, the block length is 128 bits. But keys go 16, uh, what's it called? 16, uh, 24, and 36 bytes. Yes? Correct me if I'm wrong, but are blocks based just a partition of your message? A what? A partition of your message. What is? Blocks, yes, exactly, yes. Okay. Yeah, it's just a partition of your message, but, uh, partition of your message, but we just group them back together at the end. Um, and that's exactly what this ciphertext class is. It's literally just a wrapper class that has something. By the way, all these little type aliases, they're new types, so they don't have any compiler overhead. Um, their implementation happens to be ugly, but they're just new types. So, you know, a ciphertext is actually not, like in, in practicality, it's not just a ciphertext. You have the raw ciphertext and you have the nonce. And the nonce, ha like, you have to have it public or you have to know it because if you don't know the randomness, remember, this is the IV, what we were talking about. Um, this is what helps you decrypt it. If you don't have the nonce, you don't have it. Like, you cannot decrypt the, the cyberdex unless you use a fixed nonce. And that's what we're going to talk about right now. So now let's go back. So this was the, how we actually designed this sort of construct in a functional programming concept. Now, we, we, we do need an effect type in this scenario because we hold state. Um, but now, a referentially transparent one, hopefully, except for the normies. But OK, so let's go to the, the, the exercises folder. And we're going to go to the file that's called Symmetric Crypto. So what that file is, the implementation is really dirty. But part of the reason I, ma I consciously made it this way is because I just want you to, this, this is literally, I can, I can run Everything like this, this is, this is like the, the simplest thing of how you would encrypt with CTR mode. And very, very similar to the actual implementation of CTR mode. Um, and it's very dirty and, and impure and immutable, but because we're not really, we're not going to touch this. We're going to use this as a black box. So um, I'm just going to run through it in one second. Um, essentially, your CTR mode, as we've talked about here, I'm going to re-put the diagram. I'm going to speedily do it. Counter one. Counter two, counter three. Let me put this through ENC sub K. And then we get some thing which we XOR with our message block to get C1. Well, the actual implementation looks like that. Um, except, of course, in Scala and in Haskell, we're going to have contiguous arrays. In this case, you can do it streaming, by the way. This is the nice part about this mode. But we're, we're, for simplicity, we're just going to work on the fixed length block. Um, so it takes our plain text, our key, which is a bunch of bytes, and our IV, which is, again, well, this, this, is, this is a nice part about our about TTAC is that it parameterizes over the type. So it actually gives you the length there. And all it does is that you know, for each step, we, we change the, we increment the counter. That's what counter to IV does. It's mutating it. So in, in an actual implementation, you would want the least amount of allocations. And because, you know, um, if you're not doing a parallel implementation, then you can simply just mutate the array and increment the counter one time. That's it. That's what this does. And then you encrypt the block with, with your newly incremented counter. And then what you do is that you check how many bytes are remaining. Um, Super simple stuff. And then you XOR it with the plain text. You XOR the output, which we call CT buff, because essentially we put the output. Because remember, the, the, the blocks are fixed length, so we don't need to create a new array every single time. Um, and we're going to XOR it with the plain text. And we're just going to keep running this over and over again. That's it. Um, so here's the exercise. Um, we are using, so remember, this is for a particular like counter. We increment it every time. right? And we usually assume that these counters, IV is random, right? So what happens if they're not random? So our little exercise here is going to have simply 
um, we have three ciphertexts to decipher and a fixed key. So I wrote a function for you guys to actually just run it. Um, and it's called, this one is just simply encrypt PT. So what you guys have to do is with this knowledge, and I'll help you if, if you're struggling after a little bit, after I give you, you guys some time to try it. Um, with this knowledge of what happens and what comes out, I want you to, because you have the same IV, de and by the way, you, you I, like, for the sake of what's it called, like of being, being explicit, you're allowed to encrypt one plain text of your choosing. So you, all you would have to do to encrypt the plain text is say, you know, something like, let's say, uh, encrypt PT and hello world. And this is going to give you, if we add a type annotation, this is just going to give us a summary of bytes. And I added a utility function, hint, hint, which is just XOR. So, and I imported it into scope. So if you just write under this block, if you write XOR, it just takes two arrays and it gives you another array. So with this knowledge, I'm going to give you guys, uh, do you guys want five or 10 minutes? But essentially, all you need to do is decipher the three ciphertexts um, with, by encrypting one plain text of your choosing. And remember, just, just as a hint, your IV is static. So this doesn't change. So as another hint, this is always going to give you the same thing. So what happens when you have the same thing, when, when an encryption function gives you the same thing? So this is, this is, this is the hint. And that's it. I'm not talking anymore. So you guys have uh, till 1120. How do you run it again? Sorry. Oh, this, this, this is going to be really simple. I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, all you have to do is run some random thing through encrypt PT. No, I mean, like, how do you run the code? Oh, yeah, yeah, sure, 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 sure. So it, this one's going to be cipher. Yeah. So this is going to be super simple. Just run cipher exercises. So you, you just type cipher and tab. It's going to autocomplete for you. Cipher exercises, and then you write run. Yeah, in SPT, yes, in the SPT shell. And uh, all the exercises are, are made like this. They're just like the simplest run print to console. And what I want you guys to do is print to console. If you guys don't know how to print to console, then that's fine, because there's a print decrypted one here. So this is going to print your bytes. So I'll, I'll give you another, but th this, is, this is not bearing on, on the result. Um, the bytes are UTF-8 encoded, but that doesn't matter for you, because I'm handling the encoding for you. Um, but your bytes are UTF-8 encoded, and I'm giving you the chance to encrypt a plain text of any length you choose. But now I need you to extract these three ciphertexts with that, knowing that it's in a CTR mode, and knowing that the key is the same and the IV is the same. It is not changing. So I'll give you guys till 11.25. I'll have some water. Mm. Feel free to ask me any questions, by the way, about anything except the actual answer. By the way, is, has this been too luxury so far? Or is it good? You guys okay? I couldn't get cipher exercises slash run. You, write, you type SBT first. I, I mean, I did. I did the SBT. <laughs> it all, all loaded up. Yeah. Exactly. Here's like SBT colon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let, 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 me, let me go. I'll go over there. Out of the bearing. Yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry. But yes, you have to extract and print all three if you can. Yes. So show me. Well, okay. it's not there. Well, then, then if it's not, then it's fine. So for, I don't know why yours doesn't. Run. I think it, so it is working. That, that time I misspelled it, the fact yeah. that I didn't tab in the, sorry, that, I guess it's run it through Oracle. We'll give us back cipher text. What we get is. You know your stuff. Run. Good stuff. I've been doing this for a couple years. Yeah, I figured. Yeah, sure, no problem. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's all good. You have IntelliJ? So I have all the files. Uh, okay. Oh, you have no Scala SDK module. Do you have the SBT plugin? Yes. Okay. So you know what? I'm going to do something. I'm going to close this project. And I'm going to reimport it for you. IntelliJ sucks ass, but really there's like no better choice. So like Scala tooling sucks. Okay. Wait, why is there no X? Oh, Lord. Oh, it's okay. I can get rid of it later.
Well, I wanted to re-import it, so I need to, I need to, oh, yeah, there's the X. Elusive thing. Fuck. Sorry, sorry. It's okay, it, it's, it doesn't take very long to load because the, the thing. Okay, so, okay, you're in 2017.3 point something. And, oh, sorry, could you, could you just go to that location, please? Okay, so here. Now, what can I use the SPT shell? But I guess I use this usually now. Um, oh, would like to override it? Yes, I would. So this is going to take a while because IntelliJ is awesome. But um, this should load everything. And yeah. Yeah. Sure. Sure, sure, sure. What's up? Oh, I was more, these are hex strings, yeah. uh -huh. right? Um, how do I interpret the string as bytes and vice versa? Oh, yeah, it's it's in the little comments. So you call, this is actually a helper function from TSEC, but you, you call, for example, um, let's say to decipher, mm -hmm. and you uh, decipher. Mm -hmm. that. Great, cab. God damn it. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> UTF8 bytes. And this is going to give you the bytes. Okay. Yeah, sorry. This is what it says here. Printex are in UTF8. Yeah, oh, so you use that UTF8. Yeah. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Dude, that happens to me all the time. Don't worry. Yeah, it's, it's a common thing that I have to deal with in Haskell. Like, is it a byte string or is it a hex yeah. string? Or yeah. By the way, sorry to interrupt. Um, in case anybody missed it, if you guys want to decipher the text and you need to get the bytes uh, of a particular like text, any text, um, these are UTF-8 encoded, so all you have to do is call, let's say, to decipher the, what's it called? Great autocomplete IntelliJ okay. to decipher, and you write this, and then you write, what's it called? Did I write it wrong? Oh, this is cipher 1. And then you write UTF-8 bytes, and this is a, just a helper function that's there, and that's going to give you the UTF-8 bytes. So you, 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 you are going to need to extract the bytes, so use this function, and then that's how you get bytes out of a plain text. <sighs> I know, it's fair. So this is legal. And this is just going to give you a string of n length. But ha, you're doing exactly what I would do. Yes. Yeah. Ha. So if you guys want more time, because we're, we're nearing 25. No, the goal is all you have to do, right, is you, you have, I already gave you the encryption function. By the way, remember that it's only an XOR, so encryption and decryption are the same thing, right? I get, I, I'm letting you encrypt a plain text of your choosing, right? And then I'm letting you manipulate that with the other texts that are there. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'll, I'm not supposed to give you the answer, man. But yes. You're, you're, you're getting there. Sorry? Just XOR. I imported it into scope, so you just call XOR. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, I put that into scope. So it should be like that. Yes. You guys might frustrate yourselves, but this is actually like a really easy thing to do. It, it's like the like one of the, like the simplest exercise we're doing so far. So everything from here is gonna be a lot harder, but it's okay. That's why I'm here. Yes. Yes. Do you still get that? No. Scalabri def colon this. What? What on earth? Okay, you know what? I'm gonna do one more thing. If it doesn't work, then I'm not sure what's. I, can, I mean, because I don't use SBT on Mac, so. Uh, Wait, it doesn't. Okay, target. Okay. Yeah, not built in. Then there's, there's an, uh, another thing that could possibly fail. Uh, I'll, I'm doing my best here because I think it's. Uh, BT. Are you on 1.1? Mm -hmm. 
Did you reinstall it, by the way? Yeah. With through the website? Yeah. And you managed to remove the previous one properly? Are you on a different shell or something? Yeah. No. I'm I, sorry. I'm sorry. I'm like like exhausting one, everything. Yeah, I did erase the previous. I'm, I, I am so sorry, but if you can't. Um, by the way, there, I have a function that says print decrypted. It prints bytes right there. Print decrypted. So just call print decrypted. Don't even bother with print line. It's, oh. Thank yeah, you. I made it. I made it up there easier for you. Just good to know. Um, mm. Sorry. Um, do you mind if I take your laptop to John? Sure. It's my work laptop. Oh, sure. Uh, don't worry. I'm not gonna check anything else. Have you guys dealt with this error for SVT? Which one? This thing for Max. I don't. I don't use a Mac. Redef conforms to no such helper method. Yeah, dude. Uh, which method are, is it getting called on? Because you're getting it on an SVT help command. If you no, no, just running SVT. Like, see, you see the command? Uh, just SVT. Oh, wow. What version of SVT is installed? <laughs> I asked that one. Just install this one dot one dot something. One dot one. Okay. So. I mean, that. Don't think that you see the problem. I'm seeing that there's a syntax error. What happened to know about this error? Your SBT launcher lib. He has an SBT. Oh, okay, it could be that. What's an SBT launcher lib? Okay. Uh, so, what did you use to install this? That's good. Okay. I would be in the website. Sorry? Anybody else have a question? Uh, yes, I feel like I'm still a few Sorry, you want to Yeah, sure. What's up? I did the XOR. I did the long way. Sorry. Okay. And like I, I see like very similar strings. Okay. So did you did you do the long? You did the long way. You don't did you didn't do print decrypted? No. Okay. The reason is because this is how Scala prints an array. Uh, you want to print it as a string. That's the thing. So call. So just run print decrypted. So don't run. run, run don't run. So so print decrypted on the XOR. Yes. All right. Cool. No 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 on on like on v one v two v three. Oh. Yes. So then I should. No, no, no. So, so you, you did. Okay, this is correct. Yeah. This is correct. Yeah. Run print. What's it called? Decrypt. Just write print decrypted instead of print line. Decrypted uh, v1. Yeah. Okay. By the way, IntelliJ has a vim mode. That's oh. exactly what oh, yeah. I use. Oh yeah, I use that at work. I'm just this is my home laptop, so I'm just too lazy to do it all right now. Yeah. Um. Oh. So let me see what you did. Let me help you out a little bit. Wait, sorry. Go to the file. Yeah, I know. It's, oh. This terminal is weird. I gotta get a better terminal. Um, I think it's so. We have encrypt PT. Maybe it's like I have to turn this. Um, hold on. No, you're you're. <laughs> oh, sorry. Okay, hold on. My bad. One thing. Yeah. My bad. My bad. My bad. Yeah, I think I think I. Okay. Yeah. I messed up one thing that's crucial. Those <laughs> those are hexadecimal <laughs> strings. Thank goodness. So, so to. Like sorry. Encodings. Um, no, no, yeah, it's it's okay. You know, what? all you need to do is call uh, what's it called. Uh, these are hexadecimal strings. I'm surprised I didn't catch it earlier. So you you call hex bytes unsafe. That's it. Just call head, they are hexadecimal strings. So just call hex bytes it's unsafe. It's it's. And now we'll return an array. Sorry. Yes, but but. Return an array because I just got the error that you know just two decimal one with a string and not a byte array. No, again. So, so you need you need to you need to turn to the. I mean, you can't XOR a string with a string, right? You need to XOR it with an array. Yeah. So, but again, sorry. The, the only problem is that I made a mistake, and those are not UTF-8 strings. Sorry, they're not UTF-8 strings. Clearly, they are hex strings. So, what's the function we're calling on to decipher? Hex bytes unsafe. Hex bytes unsafe. Yeah, I mean. Will that actually change the type because they're all encoded string. Yeah, no, no, no. I mean, don't, don't, don't call it there. Just call it at the entry point. So if, if I'm gonna, if I'm gonna, so if, if you guys watch here, if I'm gonna call X one on something, um, or if I want to call it, I'll, I'll say two decipher, two decipher one hex bytes unsafe. My bad. Sorry, sorry about that. Yeah. One, one, uh, everybody should update from one one five to one one six to avoid that issue. Oh, for SVT? Okay, yeah, but I, I, he's the only one with the issue so far, so I think we're good. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry, 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 sorry about that. That is my bad. How on earth do I do that? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So. What? 
To be honest, whatever in, in, encoding you use for the for the encryption one doesn't matter. Once is is John returning? Does anyone know? I mean, I'll wait for him and then we can yet yeah, we can continue because right, I I think I'll explain this now um, before we bog down too much time into this because we actually have a lot of stuff to cover. Um, so, so we have to change uh, encrypt PT to um, hex bytes on say falsa. Yes. Oh, that's actually I tried that and yeah yeah yeah. So so the, the the real transformation you would do is that you would turn it encrypt PT instead of calling s that utf bytes you would call. Oh, wait, no, 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 sorry, 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 no. Encrypt PT, no. Encrypt PT is just for you to get a random cyber, cyber text, yes? The multiplying of characters didn't seem to work in order to... Multiplying of characters? Hold on. It didn't? I mean, I, there's probably something down like... Let me see. I did this. You're, you're, you're multiplying, hold on. I think, no. Does it need to be a string? Yeah, make it a string. I'm pretty sure... Because multiple 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 interpreted as a byte. Yeah, I think that's what's happening. Wait. Let me see. Okay, you're really close, so I'm probably just gonna give you the answer. So, so okay. like, all right, sorry. I made right, let me call this. That's all I did, and then just click on that tab to see the output. Which one? Uh, this tab. Yeah. And I just got this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I know, I know what's happening. So I think you changed the PT to use. Okay. Let me see. Hello world. Explain on safe. Explain on safe. Sorry. Okay. No, you don't have the answer yet. That's why. Really? <laughs> yes, you don't have the answer. Okay. Just, just, just on the to, to decipher. That's all. Okay. Um, so I'm on the right path. I'm just not finished. Yeah, you're not finished. Okay. You're on the right path, but you're not finished. That's why it looks like that. Cool. Does the answer involve more X or Y? Yes. What do you think? <laughs> Okay. I, I saw John leaving the bathroom before me, so I don't know how to So, okay. So, I'm, I wasn't sure if I should wait. Yes? Hmm? Let me see. Only one that's done it in paper. That's good. Let me see. We have two different messages. Making you're close. Yeah, well, you're, you're close. Yeah. I'm not sure if it's exactly it. Let me see. So, you're... Okay. Cool. Like okay. Your C, your C, your C yeah. prime is your after your yeah. your your so arbitrary arbitrary. Yeah. Okay. So like two okay. Like okay. Yeah. Versus and then prime. Yeah. Okay. So you, you have C and C prime. C prime. Okay. So you're arbit Okay. You're doing this in C prime, and then you are X. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You got it. Yeah. You got it. Hey now. One person has the answer. Why would you talk to me like that, Jose? That's what? not very nice at all. About what? There you go. Except that you can't spell. No, it's not that I can't spell. No, I did a shortcut with the I think there is shell. All right. All right. Did it not work? So, did, did it not work? Uh, Sorry, let me see. Yeah. Domain class detected. Okay, wait. How did you how did you use run? I just did SPT run. No, 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 no. <laughs> that you have to go into the sub package. So you got to go into okay. into cipher dash exercises slash run. Oh, except I can't spell run. But yes. Maybe it would help to write this on the board somewhere. Okay, I'll do that. For, for the next exercise, I'm going to probably write it on the board. So if you guys want to execute it on SPT, you got to run cipher on the SPT shell, cipher dash exercises. Uh, yeah. Slash run. Yeah. Slash run. If you just run run, it's not going to work. But okay, one more minute, and then I'm going to actually go through the answer. Yeah. Isn't it simple? It's annoying, but it's tricky, but it's simple. It is. It's really, really simple. It's simple once you know how to do that. Yes. And, it, and, and no, if actually, so the, the person that had the most right approach was him. Actually, just looking, doing it on paper is probably the easiest way to look at it. Oh, really? Yeah. Sure. So if you do it on a piece of paper, that is the best way you can approach this. If you look at it as just code, you're going to struggle on it unless you're Christopher. But yes. <laughs> just kidding, you struggle too hot. Yes. Would you mind checking? Yeah, sure. So, um, so you you take C one okay. uh, and encrypt it. Okay. Get back. 
and then you XOR. M. Wait, you you encrypt C1 or you, or you XOR it with what? You XORing well, this with what? Doesn't d doesn't encrypt just. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. You so get I, okay. I you get you get C1. C1. Okay. Encrypt it. You encrypt M. You don't encrypt C1. C1 uh, is the encryption output. Just just want to yeah, let you know. Well, no, no. So so I I, I take the two decrypt one. Yeah. And call encrypt on that. No, that's not it. That's not it. No. Okay. But wouldn't that? Um, so why why? why okay. The reason the uh, that is okay. The only reason um um okay. So that would do it. But so okay. You're right, but you're not the kind of right I want you to be because I want you to. No, no, no. The reason is because in this scenario you don't have the access. You have the access to the ciphertext, but you can't call encrypt on it. Oh. So I'm trying to get I'm trying to get you to work around how you crack it in this specific way. This is this is this is the cheating way. Got it. No cheating. Okay, yeah. so the only thing you can do is encrypt a new message. Yes, and then play with the other ones. Yes. Okay. Um, and it's commutative. Okay. All right. Um, everybody, I, that has been a, quite a long time, and there's a lot of content, believe me, a lot of cool stuff. So. I'm going to actually go through the solution right now, and I'm going to go through it on the board because, in my opinion, the easiest way to tackle programs like problems with, in relationship to primitives is actually just writing them. Um, and I'm going to, if, if you didn't get the answer by now, you're going to be a little bit frustrated on how simple it actually was. Um, but, it's a really, but it's actually really cool that it is this simple. This is kind of why the cryptography, in my opinion, is so exciting. So, all right, let's partition on the notion that. When you, don't in, when you don't introduce randomness, yeah. you're going to get the same thing, right? So I'm only going to consider one block, right? So by the way, so we have an IV, right? We have essentially our ENC sub K, sub K, right? We have our ENC sub K. And then remember, this outputs, let's call this pad one. Now I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually give this one a notation. Let's going to call this P1 for, or pad one, not P1 because P1 can be plain text. But let's call this pad one, right? So what we do usually, your yes, on your encryption function, yes. Okay, so this is, and then once you extort this with a message, whoop, M1, you get C1, right? So now let's put C1 in terms of what it actually is. So we have C1 is equal to, this is a really long equals, um, m1 xor pad1, right? OK. So I gave you guys one plain text of your choosing to encrypt. And we're only considering one block. But by the way, this is going to work for any, our, like, it, all you have to do to, to, to beat this is make the block longer. Um, so we have c1 is m1 xor pad1, right? Now, you, you're, you're my adversary, you're the attacker. You can encrypt a random uh, plain text of your choosing, and you know it, and you have a reference to it. This is called a, what's it called a chosen plain text attack. Chosen being, being that you can choose a plain text and shove it through the function and get an, a ciphertext. So now let's call this um, let's see let's call this AM. So attacker message one, right? This is um, this is your the one that you were supposed to use. And this is the one that you know. So the nice part of, that you know this is that you know the bit sequence, 0001, blah, 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 blah. You know the bit sequence. So here's the solution. Um, we know we, that, and I gave you a hint that you have to run it through the same encryption function. So let's run it through this thing. And then we're going to get AC1 is equal to, uh, what's it called, AM1, AM1, XOR, pad1. Now remember, this is pad1 again, because I didn't change the IV. It's the same one. It's the same pad. So all you have to do now is play with XORs. It is the simplest thing. Now, you have to know that you can reorder XORs, right? XORs are commutative and they're associative. So however you order an XOR, you can always reorder it. So let's put this together. So let's, put, let's have, we have our, let's, let's XOR the first part. Let's XOR, let, let's, we feel like XORing A, C1, and, and just C1. So our controlled ciphertext and the ciphertext, right? And AC1. Now, let's expand these terms. So C1 is M1 XOR pad1. And this, I'm going to use this for clarity. And this attacker controlled one is AM1 XOR pad1. So what does C1 and M1 correspond to in the code? C1 is 
So 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 your your C one is two decipher one or two decipher two or whatever you want. Right. Yeah, what you control. What I, I let I let you use anything you wanted. I, that, that was a little bit of indirection because maybe, maybe you would have thought that like running a specific thing would make it make a difference. It doesn't. Um, only that you know it is the the thing. So here's the thing. Now it's probably clear to some of you what you can do with that. So remember, we have M1 XOR pad one and M and AM one. So our attacker message. What's it called? XOR pad one. So what do we do? We can reorder this, right? So when we XOR pad one and pad one, we get zero. So we get zero. And zero XOR with anything else is just itself, right? Zero XOR one is just one. Zero XOR any message is. So now we have M1 XOR AM1. Now it just happens that we have the value of AM1, right? So what do we need to do? We just add it, we just XOR AM1 to it. And this dies, and you get M1 back. The other way you will get it is if you XOR the output of your encryption and the input of your encryption, you would have Yeah, it doesn't matter. But that's the thing. It's, it's all commutative. So the, the, uh, the, the only way I think it's easier is just mostly because if you think about it this way, you already see how immediately the pads disappear, right? Technically, if we expand this the whole thing out, we're going to get M1 XOR pad 1. What's it called? Then XOR... A, well, sorry, 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 C1. C1 XOR pad 1, A C1 XOR, uh, yeah, XOR pad 1, XOR A M1, sorry, M1. M1. But yeah, so this is if you write it all out, because it doesn't matter. Order does not matter, because it's XOR, and they are commutative. Wait, so basically, if you take the output of the XOR and XOR to the original, like your plain Yes. Again. Yes, because you know it. It's a chosen plain text attack. Okay. So you already know it. Really weird symbols. Sorry? Uh, depending on if you did the hex bytes versus the UTF. Yeah, yeah. Bytes, yeah, because, because th th this is, a, and I said this is my mistake because you guys probably lost around 10 minutes on this. But the, totally, yeah, okay, yeah. It is my mistake. I'm going to admit it again. But th these were hex bytes. So if you downloaded it, if you got them in a different encoding, then, then you know, it's not going to be the same thing. I'm using hex bytes. Okay. Uh, Oh, um, yeah, encrypt PT function does not need to take hex bytes. And if it does, it's probably going to throw an exception because you probably didn't write it in hex. But, okay. Anyway, um, now let's actually get to the software implementation of it because it's actually really short. Um, so now, I actually don't need to make it a word. It can really be just gibberish. Let's call it A. No, I'm good. <laughs> and actually... Here's the thing, it helps to actually have a reference to this a, 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 a. So let's say, well, my PT, sorry, let's let's get rid of encrypt PT because this is this is actually a cyber text, not a plain text. And so this is this, and now what we do need to know is that we need to get bytes. So we, we, we will need a byte a reference to the bytes of this, but now we're gonna have val my CT, my cyber text, is equal to encrypt PT of my plain text. This is simple. And let's just run print three times. So we're going to print encrypted. Oh, decrypted, sorry. Print encrypted, decrypted. Now we're going to XOR twice. Again, the order does not matter, but I'm going to do it in the order which I presented it. So we're going to XOR, we're going to XOR twice. So we're going to XOR our ciphertext, my CT, right, with two decipher one dot hex bytes on safe. Then we're XORing that with my plain text dot UTF-8 bytes. Again, I mean the, the encoding of, of course is gonna matter if you if you if you you know if I use encrypt PT and this takes UTF-8 bytes, then of course I need the same byte sequence. And let's just copy paste this three times. Now let's run it. See what see what we get. Maybe I messed something up. And hi, LambdaCon folk, how are you doing? I hope you're all well. Congratulations on decrypting this. Yes? Why is the same thing but cut off? Like, why would that happen? Because you don't, yeah, it wasn't long enough. So you need to XOR, right? So oh. it's going to XOR as long as you have all right, so you bytes. Yes, that's why I made that A's, a lot of A's. Um, this was the solution, actually. And if you want to know something interesting, this is actually an, a practical attack. I mean, we did, it, we did it in a really stupid way in the sense that, of course, nobody would have just a fixed 
uh, IV. But the real practicality is, let's say in a real world scenario that I am a developer and I heard encryption is cool, but I actually have no idea how to use it. So encryption is this really awesome thing that the guy at LambdaConf told me about, but he didn't teach it to me well enough. So I have a server, right? And our server is using something called authenticated encryption, which I'm going to get to later, but it's, gonna, it's using AES GCM, GCM, right? And by the way, GCM mode, just consider it counter mode. Same thing. And now we have a cluster of this. And we made a mistake. GCM, same thing here. I'm just going to put a little dot. We made the mistake of, uh, of all of them using the same key. And then we made another mistake, and is that we made it have an incremental counter. Because by the way, counter mode, it's totally OK for the next, for the next um, essentially, in, in practicality, the, the way people do these nonces is that because counter mode, remember, we, it treats it as a number and it increments it. So what happens is that over, let's say, 128 bits, right? This is 128. This is a very unbalanced line in the middle. But uh, this is 128 bits. Well, I'm just going to say 16 bytes because I have to write one less number. We have the left 8 bytes can be a random number. And then the right 8 bytes can be your counter. And this can, all, this can just be zero it out. It doesn't matter. Or instead of doing this random number, this can also be a counter. So usually, in practicality, when people say use AESGCM, they give you a practical limit so you're not like encrypted unlimited stuff. You're encrypting a practical limit of, let's say, so this is 8 bits. So this is essentially, uh, so this is going to be 8 bytes. So this is going to be 2 to the 64 um, maximum ciphertext that you can encrypt, right? Because this is, this, is, this is 8 bytes, 8 bytes, which is, you know, w which is, you know, all possible, you know, byte strings are 2 to the 64. Um, yes? Why is it used so often? Isn't there like a better way to do it besides XOR? Well, I mean, how, how else do you like do it? I mean, do you, do you want to do AND? Do you want to do OR? I mean, the problem isn't, the, the vulnerability isn't XOR. It's what you did, right? The, the vulnerability is the IV, that you reuse the IV. Uh, it's because I, there exists an X, or there exists a bijection for XOR. It's yeah. the only one of the operations that's reversible. Oh. You can't reverse an OR, you yeah. can't reverse an AND. That's a better explanation than mine. Yeah, that's fair. No. Yes. So we're kind of stuck with it. So as long as yeah. like, that guy isn't the same guy all the time, we're good. Yes. Sometimes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you for complimenting me on that. We're actually explaining it better. Um, but yes, so we, may, we, so our, we as a developer use the same, I, the same key, and we initialize the same counter every time. Now, I am an adversary A or an attacker A, and I can intercept these. And I can also do something else. I can send messages to this server. So you know what? If I, man if I am an attacker and I manage to send messages in a very specific way, or maybe just every so often, if I keep intercepting these messages, every so often I'm going to get the same IV for a different message that I have a control over. So you broke AES GCM. And you broke AES GCM not because the, the, the encryption scheme is broken, but because the setup was broken. Right? So for example, in, in this scenario, um, Usually, um, you, you, unless you absolutely have to, you wouldn't use an encrypted like, thing as a token. You don't have to most of the time. Most of the time, the authentication info, you're in, you're, you, you don't have to hide it. Um, you just have to make sure it's not forged most of the time. Unless, you know, I mean, if you need it to be encrypted, most likely you're not using just this. Um, but like, yeah, so th this is essentially how you can attack like a simple construction of somebody that thinks authenticated encryption is good because I need to hide my authentication information. And they just make one mistake, and then you can exploit it. Um, so yeah, so any questions about this sort of little scheme here? I'm just saying, as an adversary, I can intercept anything, and I can also send. So send, and I, if, I, if I send, I can also intercept back because it's going to come to me, and I'm going to know the output. So that's, that's, that's a real world attack if you mess up. AES GCM. A way of you know circumventing that, I guess, is if you use something called sticky sessions, in a sense that if you were to make sure that every single one of these is using a different key, so the IV repeating doesn't make it doesn't do anything any, anymore because it's going to be a different key, and you make sure that you know so it decrypts the same thing. Each client is always going to go to one server. But I mean, this is this is not exactly a practical solution. People usually don't try to avoid sticky sessions. Um, 
but we're gonna go back to the slides. Actually, it's 11.51, I think lunch is at 12. So I'm gonna talk for only a little bit. And yeah, uh, and then we're gonna all head out to lunch. So hash functions, uh, I'm pretty sure everyone here has interacted with a hash function in some way, but I'm gonna explain them anyway. So um, a cryptographic hash function, the simplest way to explain it is mapping an arbitrary, like non-zero input, of course you have to not give it a zero length but like byte string to a fixed length, like another string, another string of a fixed length. Hash functions take arbitrary length, right? This is, can be just some length L, and it's gonna map it to some length N. So the actual, if, if I wanna write it in a little bit more mathematical notation, I can say that H of X, by the way, and H of X can't take a key, so there are keyed and unkeyed hash functions. The ones that we see at first are going to be keyed, but in general, um, most hash functions are not keyed. Um, there are some keyed hash functions, like for example, password hashers. Um, password hashers are keyed hash functions that are not purely hash functions. They're hash functions called like with a key derivation function. So it's I'll, I'll get I'll, I'll do a little side note on that later. But you can think of a hash function as essentially just some zero to one of we're gonna say plus here because it has to be at least one bit. And then that's gonna to go to some zero one. So it's gonna to go to a different byte string of length n when you know n. And, and by the way, um, I say n a lot and formally defined, um, n is usually referred to as a security parameter. Um, part of the reason I didn't like include that in every single formal definition is because it's gonna be, it's gonna be included in some, like in this one, it says the probabilistic algorithm is has a security parameter. Usually, we're talking about key length or output length. Usually, but this is actually how it's formally defined. If you pick up a textbook by Dan Bonet or if you pick up a textbook by Lindell and Katz, you're going to see that definition. Um, and you're going to see the fact that, it, that you know, uh, H takes a key. Um, and in general, actually, they all do take a key. But the difference is that for unkeyed hash functions, then it just always takes the same key. So the, the, the key is just a static string. So SHA-1 actually has to take an IV. But the, the difference, and, I, and I'll get to that soon, is that for unkeyed hash functions, um, you, it, they do take a key. It's just always the same key because everyone needs the same output. Um, so formally defined, it's just a gen and an H. Gen for, you know, it takes a security parameter. So say, you know, it's a length, um, what's it called? One to the N. Well, usually we call it one to the N because it's a N length like bit string, and then it outputs a key. It's, prob it's probabilistic, but we, we say it's probabilistic just to be general, but in general it's not. Um, but it can be for key hash functions. And then H takes that key and a string, and it's essentially this little thing right here. I don't have that much time. So, oh yeah, and by the way, when, when, we, call, when we put H in this tuple, like this way, in this formal definition, we call H a compression function. So H is gonna, you know, it, it does a little scrambling, but we call it a compression function. Um, so essentially, um, this is what I said. Most, like, despite the fact that there are keyed hash functions that exist, in general, we see unkeyed hash functions a lot. I mean, a lot, everywhere, basically. Um, and most of the time, they are of this shape, like I said before. And, you know, essentially, what actually happens in the real world when we are designing a hash function if anyone ever goes that far, is that we actually create um, a compression function that works for a fixed length. So we, we try to, in, in layman's terms, is essentially we're trying to make that little scrambler, we're trying to make it really good at scrambling. And then we're trying to make it, we're, we're trying to make it a one-way function. What is a one-way function? And I'm gonna know, mention that again later, but it's useful to mention it now. A one-way function is theoretical, by the way, it's not proven, but one-way functions, are essentially functions that are easy to compute, hard to invert. What does that mean? So that means going from h of x, if you know x, to some, let's say, um, h prime. Let's call that a hash. This is easy, right? This way is hard. And I'm going to make it in capitals because it's really hard. But it's really hard. So to the point where actually going this way, in theory, you want to make it as hard as just basically boot processing it. So as just trying random things. And the Bitcoin actually works that way. But we'll, we'll get there soon. Um, you know that already. Um, so 
because we talked about fixed length compression functions, then the way that we actually turn this like fixed length compression function into one that works with arbitrary length is something called essentially the Merkel, like the Merkel Damgaard, I don't know how to say that, A, some Swedish stuff. Um, it's a Merkel Damgaard transform. Um, and this is essentially how it works. So again, remember, we're talking about how all func hash functions take a key. But in practicality, you see that this z0, we can call it the seed, we can call it the key, whatever we want. This is usually an IV. And for unkeyed hash functions, like SHA-1, MD5, it's always going to be the same thing. So everyone knows the key everywhere. And then we take this H1. We run it through the compression function. Of course, x1, remember, if you guys remember block ciphers, this is, a, a, what's it called? A division over the length, of course. And we run it through the compression function. And then we take the output of that compression function. And then we run it through the other thing and blah, 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 blah. Basically, almost CTR mode. And we get an output, h of x. That is the Miracle Demgar transform. And I will get more on that. I think it's 1157. Um, do you guys want to go for lunch now? Yes. Um, is that x sub 1, is that a byte or a bit? Or it's a block. It's a, it's a, it's a block, yes, yes. So this is a block. This is a block. This is this, 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 uh, this, the same idea as block ciphers. Um, for all hash functions or just? No, not, not necessarily all. But for example, the SHA ones are used the, the merkle damgaard transform. Okay. I think Kekaka is a little bit different. Yes? Is there a link to these slides so if you let them follow along? Sorry, a length? No, no, no. I haven't posted them. I could post them now if you want. That'd be cool yeah. stuff. Yeah, sure. Um, I'm very curious to ask. I'm still looking for it on the slide. You know what I can do? I can do something cool, which is not exactly cool. Um, I'm going to take this. I'm going to put it in the repo, and I'm going to push it to the master branch. <laughs> <laughs> this is this, this, that's, that's what you call proper software development. Um, and so I, I, I'm, I'm very sorry that your, your beautiful solutions are going to die. And they're going to be replaced by my solution to, your, to the hash function exercise. But I'm going to post this over here. And then we are going to never. <laughs> my solution is clearly the best solution. So you're going to live with it. This is a dictatorship. Added slides and solution to one. Hit push you origin master. Oh no. Wait. Oh no. I have to, I have to give you all my secrets. Would it be, wouldn't it be terrible if I press control paste right now? OK. Anyway, if you guys get stash, get pull master branch, or get reset, then it's going to be there. So you're going to be able to pull the presentation. It's on the master branch now. Thank you. No problem. How do you quit SPT? You, you pray it exits. I'm just kidding. You just control C. Yeah, yeah. I call it to exit. Yeah. You can do exit. <laughs> you shut off your computer. <laughs>